Hello friends, the theme of today's lecture is State in Islam. The main objective of this lecture is to understand the idea of State in Islam, the meaning of the concept of State in Islam, origin and roots of State in Islam, an evaluation of the concept of State in Islam, a critical assessment of the concept of State in Islam. Islam, unlike other religious traditions, doesn't confine its teachings to the transcendental concerns, divine reality, and mystical practices only, but it also deals with the mundane aspects of mankind. Islam, having a holistic approach towards life and its challenge, hasn't ignored political dimensions of human life. State, politics, and government are such issues about which Islam lays down certain guidelines. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not only a prophet in a strict sense, but he was also a statesman who in his own lifetime laid the foundation of a state in Medina. His successors, known as caliphs, further reinforced the principles of running a state as were laid down by the holy prophet, peace be upon him. The principles and guidelines followed by prophet and caliphs for governance, polity, constitute, the essence of what state in Islam means. The upholding of these guidelines and principles distinguish the Islamic state from other states. The Quran, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him's practice and that of his four rightly guided caliphs forms the basic touchstone for the present day Islamic state. Since the establishment of state in Medina by Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and its successive expansion under the four caliphs, the term caliphate and caliph was used for the state and its head. This caliphate with its unique ideals of rule of law, justice, republican character, freedom of expression, right to depose the caliph, non-heredity character and tolerance still continues to inspire Muslim masses to struggle for the establishment of an Islamic state that would live up to the golden ideals as it had in the past. Over the centuries, the concept of state in Islam developed conceptually, historically, as well as juristically too. All the four schools of Sunni Islamic thought, that is the Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, and Hanbali, have engaged with this concept of state in Islam, while the same can be said about the Shia schools of thought, like the Isna Asharia, Ismailis and Zaydis. The genesis of the present discourse about the Islamic State can be traced back to the colonialism of Muslim lands that happened in the aftermath of Renaissance. This colonialism with its cultural, economic, educational and social baggage confronted Muslims with new challenges in all these fields. The Muslim political theorists also responded to these new issues and situations in which the concept of Islamic State became the central focus. In the past one century, various Islamic scholars, ideologues and thinkers have engaged with the concept of State in Islam and tried to reconcile the modern state with the Muslim political practice of the past. A few notable among them, Mulana Abul Ala Maududi, Mulana Hamidullah, Sayyid Qutb, Yusuf al-Karzawi and Taqiyuddin al-Nabhani, etc. Now, the state in Islamic concept and practice. Islam doesn't have any separate theory for the origin of the state. However, there is an Islamic view of how the affairs of the state are to be conducted by the Muslims. In this regard, the Prophet of Islam, during his own lifetime, was able to establish a political community of his own followers and others after he migrated to Medina in the year 622 Christian era. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was successful in laying the foundation of a state when he migrated to Medina from Makkah. The most authentic idea of Muslim concept of politics and state need therefore to be inferred from the way he conducted the politics during the 10 years of his life in Medina after his migration. During this period, he also gave guidance from the divine revelation in the form of Quran. Quran also contains several verses that guide the believers about conducting their political affairs, like 
those who respond to their Lord and establish regular prayers and who conduct their affairs by mutual consultation and who spend of what we have bestowed on them. Surat al-Shura Quran further continues this discourse as God has promised it to those of you who believe and do the things that are right that he will cause them to succeed others in the land as he gave succession to those who were born before them and that he will establish for them that religion which they delight in and that after their fear he will give them security in exchange. They shall worship me nor shall they join partners with me. Quran further states about the need of justice and power as we sent aforetime our messengers with clear signs and sent down with them the book and the touchstone of right and wrong, that men may stand forth in justice. And we sent down iron, in which is great might, as well as many benefits for mankind. The Muslim community has been declared as the best community by the Quran if it fulfills certain responsibilities. You are the best of the peoples evolved for the mankind, enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. Surah Al-Imran Allah describes the quality of Muslims as the servants of Rahman, the Lord of mercy, are those who walk humbly on the earth and who, when they foolish address them, reply with peace. Surah Al-Furqan These verses explicitly point out that the state in Islam or Islamic state is based on the obedience of God and Islam and is granted as a result of righteous deeds and its aim is to enjoin good and forbid evil. Islamic State forbids the ruler from the arrogance of power and espouses him to observe humility while conducting the affairs of the state. The ruler wields the power because of the trust reposed in him by the people and he must remain true to the spirit of Islam and welfare of people while delivering his duties. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him implemented these injections of the Quran relating to the political matters when he organized a political community that later on led to the foundation of the state of Medina. When Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his companions migrated to Medina, its two big tribes, Awas and Khazraj, were tired of their more than a century long internecine war. Hence, they readily accepted Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as their leader and became Muslims. This new development helped them overcome the mutual rivalry and be united under the creed of a new faith. The Muslim inhabitants of Medina were declared as Ansars, helpers, and those who migrated from Mecca as Muhajiroon, immigrant community. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made Ansars and Muhajirs brothers that further led to the unity of Muslims and became a precursor for the permanent foundation of the new state. Further, Prophet Muhammad took another step of entering into treaty with non-Muslim subjects of Medina that comprised particularly of various Jewish tribes. This treaty is better known as Charter or Constitution of Medina. It contains various provisions to be adhered jointly by Muslims and non-Muslims when it came to the protection of the state as well as making new allies. One fundamental point of the charter reads as, if anyone attacks someone who is a party to this pact, the others must come to his help. Thus an attack on one party was to be taken as an attack on all. That would lead to joint united defense against enemies. It further reads, the parties to this pact are bound to help each other in the event of an attack on Medina. It also contains many guidelines to be upheld during the times of war and peace. It also upholds the concept of mutual consultation. The parties of this pact must seek mutual advice and consultation among themselves on different issues related to the common concerns. This charter grants equal rights to all the parties of the pact. It states, the Jews who are a party to the treaty along with the believers will be helped and treated with equality. 
No Jew will be wronged for being a Jew and those in alliance with the Jews will also be given the same treatment as the Jews. The Jewish tribes were also given the freedom of following their own religious and personal laws and according internal autonomy too. Thus, this charter is a testimony of the fact that the state of Medina was plural in its character as it gave complete religious and personal freedom to non-Muslims. Along with equality, the charter also laid down fundamental provisions for upholding justice and rule of law. If anyone is found guilty of any act inimical to the treaty, all the believers will oppose him, even if he be the son of any one of them. This principle is enshrined very well in the Quran as, O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. Whether one is rich or poor, Allah is more worthy of both. So follow not your personal inclination, lest you will not be just. And if you distort, your testimony or refuse to give it, then indeed Allah is all-knowing with what you do. Surah Al-Nisa Quran, while upholding the principle of justice, further states, O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm for Allah, witnesses in justice, and do not let the hatred of a people prevent you from being just. Be just, that is nearer to righteousness, and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is acquainted with what you do. Surah Al-Maida Hence, the Charter of Medina lays down the principles of the state of Medina, its conduct, and how it's supposed to maintain the relations among the adherents of various faiths inhabiting Medina. Thus, the state of Medina contains various features of the present-day states. Thus, the origin of state in Islam is traced back to the state that was founded in Medina by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and after him managed by his righteous caliphs. The manner in which Holy Prophet and the caliphs carried out the affairs of the state thus becomes the basis from which essential principles, characteristics, and conduct of an Islamic state can be discerned. The Prophet and his righteous caliphs conducted the affairs of the state according to Islam, but they also used their own personal reasoning when situations demanded and circumstances called for. These all independent decisions were reached through ijtihad that was in conformity with rulings of Islam. Thus, the Islamic state is open to accept new challenges that arise with changing times and isn't rigid in its nature. The feature of ijtihad makes the Islamic state dynamic in nature and its aims and objectives are those laid down by the Islam and depicted by Holy Prophet and his caliphs that among other things included justice, welfare, rule of law, upholding divine commandments of God, forbidding evil and promoting good etc. Now, the features of state in Islam. The ruler in Islam isn't authoritarian and doesn't have a free hand to carry out the affairs of state and politics as per his wishes and whims. The ruler, state and its machinery are subservient to the teachings of Islam and the guidelines laid down by the Almighty. The state, government and its conduct are to be carried out keeping in view the spirit of Islam. The ruler and those who are at the helm of the affairs are accountable before judiciary as well as people. An independent judiciary is always an essential fundamental feature of an Islamic state. Any group or a person can't claim to be sovereign and abuse the state power wantonly based on his personal whims. Hence, Islam uses the word caliphate, vicegerent or God's trustee who acts according to the principles laid down by the Islam for government and Amir, one who is reposed with responsibility and trust for the head of the state and government. The difference that Caliph or Amir doesn't hold absolute powers can't remain in power if he doesn't command the respect and the trust of the Shura 
that comprises the candidates who represent the consent and wishes of the majority population. This feature makes caliphate stand apart from theocracy as well as from the divine right of kings. The institution of caliph is also non-heredity as Prophet peace be upon him and his righteous caliphs debarred their progeny to be claimants of caliphate. We witness that after the demise of Holy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, the four successive caliphs were selected or elected through different mechanisms of selection or election. The first caliph Abu Bakr was endorsed unanimously when he was proposed as a caliph by Umar in a public congregation and all people consented to his leadership as a caliph. Abu Bakr during his last days consulted people seeking their opinions about the suitable candidate who was to be the next caliph and he reached the conclusion through consensus that Umar was acceptable to most people. So he declared Umar as the next caliph and people accepted him as caliph too. Next Umar constituted a panel of six members on his deathbed and ordered them to choose one candidate among themselves as the next caliph while debarring his son from being a part of that committee. They chose Usman ibn Affan as the caliph after consulting people and keeping in consideration their views, opinions and popularity of Usman ibn Affan. The third caliph couldn't complete his whole term and was martyred by Muslim rebels. So people decided that Ali should be the next caliph in the midst of crises that were baffling the Islamic caliphate. Thus it becomes evidently clear that the head caliph or Amir of an Islamic state can be selected, elected in different ways and through various procedures, but this selection election needs to draw approval from the people. Also certain parameters have to be taken into consideration that include consent of the masses, non-hereditary nature of the institution of caliphate, tolerance of dissent, selection for lifetime unless caliph lo lost the confidence and support of the masses and the freedom to opt for any method for the election or selection of the caliph while keeping the principles of Islam Quran, prophetic practice and rule of law in consideration. Thus in the Islamic state, the absolute authority and power doesn't belong to a person or a group of people and or a certain class, nor is it inherited hereditarily. The authority vested in the caliph is a trust reposed in him by the Muslims and he has to adhere to the divine principles of Islam and uphold the same. All the people including the caliph or amir are the same and owe obedience to God alone. A delegated sovereignty is bestowed on the amir to conduct various affairs of the state in accordance with the principles of Islam and he is accountable to the people. The welfare activities and the egalitarian character remain the striking features of the Islamic state. There is also no exception to rule of law as it is uniformly applicable on every citizen of the Islamic State. Holy Prophet emphasized on these and many other fundamentals in his last sermon. Quranic principles form the cornerstone and constitution in the working of an Islamic State. One of the foremost aims of the Islamic State is to impose and uphold the divine rules and laws laid down by the Almighty about various affairs and fields of life. Its purpose is also to enjoin good and forbid evil within its territory. Both the good and evil within the Islamic state are considered holistically and it pertains to all fields that include but aren't confined only to the social, political, cultural, economic and educational. There are many features that make the Islamic state different from other modern day states as it doesn't believe in the separation of religion from politics and statecraft. Despite these differences, there are elements like egalitarianism, rule of law and welfare oriented nature of the Islamic state that gets it closer to the concerns of modern constitutional and democratic state. Friends, we are running short of time and we will conclude the first part of the lecture on the concept of Islamic state. 
Today we discussed meaning, concept and features of Islamic State. In the next episode of the lecture, we will be discussing various parameters and some criticism of the concept. Meet you again. Till then, goodbye.